Lonnie. Thank you. This is bright. I think I need that hat. Somebody mentioned that hat. But anyway, thank you, Tom. Appreciate that. And uh, thank you for the invitation, James. And it's great to be here. Um, I'm here for a couple of days. We are also doing some business with Aldebaran. A couple of words about Aldebaran to start with. Great company, great technology, but more than that, great people. Just makes you keep coming back to Fargo. This is my fourth trip. Looking forward to coming <laughs> come more often uh, as, as we progress our partnership. Uh, so today I have two goals. Um, the first one is really, uh, just a show of hands, how many people here know Sarapta Therapeutic? Okay, so the first objective goes to that to sort of introduce Sarapta in a broader perspective, you know, it's a higher level view on Sarapta, what we are trying to do, uh, disease areas and the pipeline we are trying to build there. And the second objective is to share some recent data that we announced in the World Muscle Society on one of our first programs, gene therapy programs that are advancing in the clinical trials. Uh, so with that, uh, let me jump. Uh, so I, I think, um, you know, because we are a publicly traded company, it's, uh, you know, I, this is something that everybody should read. I'm not saying you should read it now. Uh, but I got to put this out there. Uh, but it's on the investor page as well if you wanted to take a look at it. Uh, so the mission uh, for us is really being a precision medicine company treating rare neuromuscular diseases. There are out there about 7,500 rare diseases and probably one third of them are in the neuromuscular area. So there, there's your opportunity. And, and really we dream big, and live fully, and so patients can journey far. And so this is a set of a purpose slide here. And, and this particular kid, I can't talk about who it is and you know, what, uh, what drug he took, but literally in the disease state, he cannot, from a, a lying down position, turn back and get up. But once he takes the drug, one of, one of the drugs that we, we have in Sarepta, uh, he can do what he's doing in the slide. And, and so this is a slide that we use uh, quite a bit to show what is our purpose in this. And this is, where, this is what we are all for. Eventually, I think any kids out there, uh, we work on a lot of the X-linked pieces, so any kids out there can get the drug and, and you know, be, grow up young, young people and, and uh, young men and young, young persons. And really the company is, um, it transformed itself over the years, uh, but in the last couple of years, this has been uh, really phenomenal. Uh, so the company, when I started in, in January of this year, we were about 200 people, and today it's about 427 people and still continuing to grow, uh, hoping to touch about 500 by the end of the year. Uh, we are in nine global locations. Uh, we have almost, uh, uh, you know, two dozen or so pipeline compounds. I'll talk about that a little bit in the, in the upcoming slide. And we work in three different modalities, and these are PMOs, PPMOs, and gene therapy uh, space. And the uh, top one third of this slide is the PMO, PPMO part of the portfolio. So I apologize, this is not very readable from where you're sitting, but the, the top uh, one third of this, the purple color, uh, is the PMO, PPMO portfolio. So PMO stands for phosphorodiamidate morpholine oligomers. These are synthetic molecules that mimic the RNA, natural RNA, with the bases that we have in RNA. And you can design these entities as you wish. Uh, there is opportunity to put positive charges and variety of things that you can put on to, to extend the circulation, things like that. So this has been proven successful. We use this to make antisense so we can skip exons uh, in, in certain disease indications where there is mutated protein or if the protein production doesn't exist because of mutated gene. Uh, and, and there are uh, a number of exons we are looking at in the, you know, the Shane muscular dystrophy area. We are looking at 
uh, a few exons, 51, which is the commercial product. We call this a Teplerson exon as 51. We are looking at 45 as well as 53 as the next set of products. But these exon skipping drugs treat only certain percent of the population. Therein lies the reason why we are thinking about gene therapy and we have been uh, you know, making enough progress in that area. And the next set of modality we are talking about here is you know, peptide dependent PMO platforms. The reason uh, for that is to make sure these PMO molecules can cross the uh, cell surface efficiently so you have a way to deliver this drug better. And so these PPMO, peptide appended PMO platform is the next four parts that we are looking at. Again, this, this platform is going to treat percent of population, 13% uh, you know, here, 10% there, and, and that kind of approach. And so therein lies why we are going to the second one, two thirds of the, um, you know, the, the next uh, half of the slide here, which is, uh, you know, blue color here, which is all gene therapy based approaches. Uh, we started out the gene therapy portfolio, building out that portfolio using DMD as, as sort of the starting point. And from that point on, really expanded that scope into other uh, disease areas, such as the limb girdle, muscular dystrophies, and other CNS disorders like Pompeii disease and, and other diseases. And I'll talk about that a little bit in the upcoming slide. Really therapeutic area focus here. As I said, we were the Duchenne Muscular Dystrophy Company for a large, large part of the company's existence, almost 25 plus years, and built a lot of understanding on the disease biology on the muscular dystrophy area. Uh, and then we are sort of expanding that knowledge into other areas, as you can see, you know, limb girdle muscular dystrophy is the next set of area that we are looking at. And, and again, this is a group of diseases, not one disease. There are about 27 are so subsets of limb, limb girdle muscular dystrophies, and um, you know, are, are five or six of them are sort of primary diseases in that setting. And uh, we have recently announced a partnership with Maya Nexus Therapeutics where we are focusing on some of those dystrophies uh, in that setting. Uh, and more recently announced a, a collaboration with uh, Lacerta Therapeutics focusing on Pompa disease. And uh, there was a talk earlier about Pompa, and it's a, it's a clearly um, upcoming area, and a lot of understanding needs to be developed there. And more recently announced a collaboration with Nationwide Children's Hospital on Shakomari Tooth, uh, so-called CMT. And this is another area of disease that we are interested in. Again, more and more moving away from musculoskeletal to neuromuscular sort of, sort of setting. A uh, couple of weeks ago, we did announce a collaboration with Lysogene in France, uh, targeting um, more lysosomal storage disease, um, such as the, the MPS3, uh, 3A type of setting, and, and other diseases in that as well. I'm not going to read through all this. It's just for your information. I want to shift gears a little bit, talk about DMD. So this is an interesting uh, journey for me as well. Uh, you know, I've, I've worked in various areas, but I've never understood musculoskeletal. So this is a great opportunity to, to, for, for me to learn this, uh, this uh, area as well. Uh, obviously, the reason for DMD is lack of a protein called dystrophin. Dystrophin is sort of a shock absorber protein in everyone's muscle. And the reason we have this muscle going back and forth as, as a flexible way is because of this dystrophin protein. And dystrophin is, uh, is one of the largest protein in human body. And, um, and, and so lack of this protein can create havoc in people's life. People are born with this. Uh, it's a monogenic disease. Uh, and clearly, um, you know, the, the idea would be to create opportunity so people who don't have dystrophin in the muscle can generate dystrophin in that muscle. So just a bit about the disease progression. And, and the kids, when they're born five to seven year age, I don't have the entire panel here, but, you know, it starts with five to seven year old. Uh, there's a lot of motor delay type of things, uh, can't walk, can't get up, um, and, and so on and so forth. And as they progress, uh, you know, they, they have increasing loss of um, walking ability, uh, and then they are in the wheelchair for part time. Uh, by 11 years, 13 years, they are completely, you know, losing ambulation, they go on the wheelchair, then they gain weight also because of that. Uh, and then they have problems associated with that. 
Uh, by the time they are teens, um, you know, loss of upper, upper limb function, uh, in, increasing respiratory function as well, it becomes a problem. And then by the time they get to, um, you know, late teens and 20s, uh, the heart doesn't function anymore and, and uh, you know, it becomes a problem for them. So this is the progression of the disease. And so I'm going to skip this a little bit. Uh, it's a history, so people can look at it. So what um, SERPTA did is to look at a, a way to create dystrophin in, the, in, the, in these patients. Uh, so this is um, a problem because dystrophin gene is so big that you can't pack this in any of these delivery weights as a gene therapy delivery mechanism. So we had to go to something called a micro dystrophin gene. The micro dystrophin gene cuts uh, some of the spectrum repeats that you saw there. And so instead of the 17 spectral repeats you see there, we you know, sort of trimmed it down to functional parts of this molecule, keeping the C terminus and I N terminus, put whatever is functional intermediates there and see if that works. And that, uh, you know, seemed to um, work well uh, because of some of, the, some of the things that we did with this entity. Uh, we put in a promoter, which is uh, uh, creating kinase 7, and this promoter helps overexpression in the heart, and, and these, these kids need uh, their heart to work some part in time, so we wanted to make sure we can express this in their heart. And the vector uh, also, uh, you know, choice of vector is uh, RESUS 74, which is also a low immunogenic uh, uh, vector. And the construct uh, also contains, which we believe is the functional repeats and that spectral repeat that we talked about earlier. Uh, so again, expectations based on preclinical model is listed here. Uh, we expect efficient transduction into all sorts of muscle types. Uh, we selected this promoter for cardiac and skeletal transgene transduction. Uh, and widespread microdisruption ex uh, expression is um, seen in all the biopsy muscles. And uh, reduction in CK. CK is known to be a hallmark of this disease, muscle wasting disease. So reduction in CK is critical observation to say that the drug in fact works and the safety profile. And this is just a, a eye chart here, you know, different types of muscles you see and how these dystrophin positive fibers are seen in that using this micro dystrophin um, gene therapy. And you can see uh, these, uh, these dystrophin expressions at various levels of viral load. Uh, certainly is, uh, is giving us a comfort level to, to go into patients. Uh, this is actually patients from the four subjects that were treated in the, the microdystrophin trial so far. And the top panel here is pre-treatment, and the bottom panel is treated kids post-treatment, and you can see how well it compares to the normal controls that you see on the left-hand side. Uh, just quickly looking at the dystrophin expression by Western blot, you can see clearly all these subjects show the levels of microdystrophin we want to see in their muscle tissues. Uh, and, and clearly the, the uh, Western blot shows that these four subjects express microdystrophin in their system after treatment. Uh, this is a summary of clinical data here. This is um, North Star Ambulatory Assessment. This is a, a group of about 17 tests to assess how these kids do, can stand up, can walk certain length in certain time, can go up the stairs, certain number of stairs in certain time. They can run uh, 100 meters in certain amount of time, uh, lift their head, you know, so on and so forth. And, and the total score that you would, um, you would do here is, you know, every one of those tests, they tested two, they are normal, and if they tested zero, they are not normal. So, you know, essentially, ideally, you want to be at 34. And you can see in this, uh, in this um, column, uh, there is a change in how these kids score in these tests, and clearly indicating in every one of these uh, areas that you can see improvement, how these four kids are doing. And safety, again, no serious things. Uh, anything we saw, non-serious things can be uh, resolved quickly. Uh, so the bottom line here is, you know, we have data from patients now. These four kids are doing extremely well after uh, one dose of this microdystrophin uh, gene. And, uh, you know, safety looks very good uh, for us to move forward. Uh, so now just quickly shifting gears here, talk about uh, very, very quickly limb girdle muscular dystrophy. 
And so this is, as I said, a group of uh, uh, 27 or so disease subtypes, and we are interested in five of them here. It's a progressive disease. Uh, it's again another muscle wasting disease, but targeting certain lymph functions and so on and so forth. Um, and, and um, you know, certainly there's a connection between DMD and limb girdle muscular dystrophy because of how dystrophin is um, connected within the muscle tissues, connected through a group of uh, proteins called dystrophin associated proteins. And a couple of those proteins are circoglycans, and these limb girdle. Um, dystrophies come from lack of circoglycans in the muscle tissues. And the, the, the answer there is, can we create the gene that will provide them the opportunity to express various types of circoglycans? So you can upregulate the dystrophin-associated complex, and that way you can help dystrophin um, to, to work functionally in these patients. And the leading programs in this area we are looking at are three of them, targeting three circoglycan, alpha, beta, gamma, and uh, they have sort of listed some of the uh, characteristics here. Uh, and beyond that, we are looking at a variety of CNS disorders, and the, the POMPA disease here is, a, is an interesting one. And again, uh, it's a sort of a lack of um, AA, GAA, acid alpha glycosidase, uh, it's responsible for metabolizing glycogen in, in various tissues. Otherwise, these glycogen molecules accumulate in various parts of the you know, tissues, organs, and, and your functional ability goes away. The key is for us to be able to say, we have a gene that we can provide and expresses this glyco glycosidase, which can and, and restore the normal metabolism of glycogen. Uh, and the leading programs here are, um, you know, disclosed one is POMPA, and the other two are uh, non-disclosed non one, and, and again, we're looking at it very carefully. Some point in time, we'll make announcement on this. Uh, Shakomari tooth, uh, this is um, a group of hereditary degenerative nerve diseases. Uh, it can affect a variety of skills, motor skills, um, weakness, um, patient's ability to walk, use their hands, so on and so forth. Uh, most common inherited neuromuscular disease affecting over 2.8 million people. So I, when I heard about it, I was surprised. You know, there are so many people out there with this type of uh, issue. And this is caused by um, an uh, extra copy of PMP23 gene and uh, approximately about 50,000 people. Uh, and, and again, our interest is in this program called NT3 from Nationwide, and we hope that uh, we can get into clinical trials in 2019 for, for this indication. Last but not least, this uh, mucopolysaccharidosis type 3A. This is a uh, lysosomal storage disease. Uh, again, it's a very rare disease. It's one of the rarest of the rare diseases that I've seen. Uh, and the bottom line here is uh, the, the one of the genes, the SGSH gene, uh, is mutated or it's not there. Uh, and, and so the question is, can we create that gene and, again, give the opportunity for these newborn kids to um, live without this disease? Uh, so the, the announcement that, that came out with lysogene targets this SAF302 program. It's in pivotal phase, actually, starting now, uh, and, and hopefully we'll have good data that we can bring this forward. Uh, so with that, I'm going to stop, and um, I want to thank again the organizers. This was actually a wonderfully organized meeting because, uh, you know, to organize a meeting like this, it takes a conference company to do it. And I hear uh, from what I understand, people have day job here, and still they took the time to organize this. And thank you for that. And with that, I'll stop. Any questions, I'm happy to answer. Yeah. Thank you, Polani. Uh, wow, OK. 24 pipeline programs, three modalities, that is spinning. Uh, how do you keep it all together? How do you keep it moving? Well, I think one of the things we have to um, do is be realistic. We have to be ambitious, but we should also be realistic. And, um, you know, the, the data that we saw there is really outstanding. It's amazing data, but it's, uh, it's from four patients, and we hope that the rest of the patients will respond in that way. Uh, so uh, my answer is, you know, we don't want to get caught up in, in this and, and make sure that uh, you're humble enough 
and you you collect enough good partners that can walk with you rest of the way and get this to rest of the patients uh, so it's a it's a mindset and uh, it's not easy uh, initial data are initial data but uh, you know again Sarapta's policy is that uh, you know we'll go out and get all the help we need we'll build uh, capabilities and capacities inside as well and take it forward. Hey, Blani, great, great talk. Thanks for uh, coming out. Um, I was real curious about the RH74 choice for the serotype. You mentioned immunogenicity. What, what percentage of humans have pre-existing antibodies that, you know? I think there is a, a different, you know, it depends who you ask that question, right? Different people give you a different answer, but from some of the data I have seen, there's about 15% 15 per, 15 of patients screen out, you know, from, from the, the limited pool that we have right. seen, about 15% screen out. And was that choice, I mean, it, clearly that was a factor driven into it, but was, were there other factors like is it really good tropism for the muscle i mean it was a combination of things what other things went it's, into that it's decision? a it's a it's a great question it, it was a designed uh, approach uh, you know in some ways i think nationwide has defined this uh, for expression in, in variety of muscle tissues uh, optimized for that pur purpose and the promoter there is a, a purposeful design again to make sure that we can express this in the heart uh, because eventually, I think that's what's going to get you. So let's make sure there's a promoter that will get you enough of this stuff in expression in the heart tissues. So it was all done by that mechanism. And, and uh, you know, RH74 by common nomenclature will compare uh, favorably to AAB8, uh, which, which certainly has tropism to a variety of muscles. Right, because I, you know, the other programs you're licensed, like I think the lysogene is AV9, I want to say. Uh, yeah, I would, yeah. Okay, so, yeah. so those other programs, it's just whatever serotype showing promise there, you're not married to RH74 for, for everything. Yeah. Right, I, you know, I think eventually I think you, you'll have to look at it, right? I think, you know, if the, the broader clinical data shows that this is not behaving as the way it is supposed to be, then you'll have to look at it carefully. But, but again, I would just caution that anybody who says it's AB8 or 9 or 6, I think it's not as black and white as the numbers seem to indicate. Um, you know, we talked about AV6, AV6 earlier, and people talk about mutation in these serotypes, uh, and, and so it's not clear to me if somebody said AV9, it's, it's really AV9. Yeah, or or is, what is AV9, right? What is AV9, <laughs> right, exactly. Right. And I'll last, and with the, I think the $64 question in some of these uh, things, when you, you, know, you look at, um, the muscular dystrophies and the quantities that you're going to have to dose uh, patients with, and the number of patients, and you start to do that math, and and it's it's a lot. What are your guys' plans or thoughts on how to how to uh, get all that stuff made? Yeah, that's the reason we need partners like Aldebaran, right? So we can we can make enough of this. I, I think the bottom line here is you are you are doing this systemically. You can choose to do this limb by limb. You know, you can minimize. But that's not the most convenient way patients want to see it. We talk about patient centricity uh, so much these days. We want to make sure patients have this, you know, uh, very, very, very well from, from their perspective. And so we're not too worried about, um, you know, th those high doses and our ability to get that and get the partnership so that we can make those materials and patients can get it convenient for them. Is a critical piece of uh, piece of that, and and uh, as we are progressing in this relationship and other relationship, we are always looking for capacity uh, to make sure we can make sufficient quantities of these materials without impacting patients, you know, comfort and convenience.